Jesus entered the temple courts and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or from men? They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, we are afraid of the people. They all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered, but later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. John came to you to show you the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them more than the first time and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his sons to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir, come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvellous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus's parable, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. Thanks very much, Emma. Uh, it happened on October the 1st, 1975, in Quezon City in the Philippines, uh, the greatest boxing match of all time, the thriller in Manila. One billion viewers tuned in uh, to watch the reigning heavyweight champion of the world, smoking Joe Fraser, take on his arch rival, long-standing opponent, Muhammad Ali, the greatest of all time. After 14 rounds of intense conflict in the sweltering heat of the Philippine summer with both boxers on their last legs, Muhammad Ali was finally proclaimed victor. He reclaimed his title. It was an epic battle. As we come this evening to Matthew 21, we see here another epic battle. Jesus steps into the ring and he takes on the entire Jewish religious establishment. Now, at the beginning of um, the chapter, he's come to Jerusalem and he's come with two symbolic acts. First, coming in on a donkey. Second, uh, clearing out the temple. But these acts were a little bit like the press conference. Now we have the fight. And today's passage is a little bit like round one. And over the next few weeks, as we look at these chapters towards the end of Matthew's gospel, uh, we see the temperature rising as the battle rages. It culminates in Jesus' 
tirade against the religious leaders in chapter 23, where he repeats this phrase, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you. And then in chapter 24, when he predicts the end of the temple, the destruction of this great building, the end of this official, official Jewish religion. But here is where the story starts. Verse 23, Jesus is teaching in the temple. The chief priests, the elders of the people, uh, together they represent um, the Sanhedrin. They come to Jesus like a pack of hungry wolves. And they say, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? In other words, Jesus, who do you think you are on our turf, acting like this, driving out merchants, clearing the tables, healing, teaching? Who are you? It's a direct challenge. And in this section that we see today, what Jesus does, he responds with a question and then he teaches two parables. And what he's doing is exposing their religion as an absolute sham. Jesus goes on the front foot. The message this evening is that religious frauds who do not repent and believe will not enter the kingdom of God. That's what we're going to learn this evening. And this message, I take it, is a message that you and I need to listen to very carefully. Because there is a particular temptation for those who claim to follow God, and I take it that's many of us here this evening, for deceit. I was um, reading a few years ago uh, a book by Rosaria Butterfield on the topic of hospitality. You may have come across it or read it. The Gospel Comes with a House Key, that's what it's called. And in that book, she talks about a particular case of church discipline in her church, someone who turned out to be a fraud. And she reflected on this incident by saying that only the church can produce a Judas. I thought it was a striking comment. Someone who looks so genuine, but actually is a fraud. You may be aware that just recently, a whole host of allegations have come out against the well-known Christian apologist, Ravi Zacharias. He died recently. And tragically, there seems to be a good reason to believe he was guilty of all kinds of abuses. Um, it looks like he was a religious fraud. It happens today. And in this passage, Jesus diagnoses the problem and he pleads with us not to go the same way. So as he exposes the religion of the religious leaders, uh, we ask the question, why is it that their religion is a sham? And we have three reasons why. Here's the first. And it's this, they're not interested in the truth. So on hearing this challenge, Jesus, by what authority do you do these things? Jesus makes an offer. He says, well, look, I'll answer you if you answer me. Verse 25, John's baptism, he says, where did it come from? And was it from heaven or from human origin? In other words, do you think John the Baptist was genuine? What do you think? Was he from God or was he a fraud? That's the question. Now, why does Jesus bring up John? I take it because of the connection between Jesus and John. Now, John was the forerunner of Jesus, the one who came to prepare the way. He testified about Jesus. And if you accepted John's testimony, well, then you'll accept Jesus. The two rise and fall together. Now, at the time when John was around, he's dead by this stage, well, many people did accept John, but not these people, not the religious leaders, not the religious establishment. And yet they don't want people to know that. Not many people do. It would make them unpopular because John was popular. And so it's a tricky question. The chief priests and the elders of the people, they discuss, they say, well, look, if we say from heaven, he goes, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we're afraid of the people uh, because they will hold that John was a prophet. So they say, we don't know. And Jesus says, okay, <laughs> But I'm not going to answer your question then. Neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. Now, what is going on here? What's Jesus doing? What I think he's doing is exposing their unbelief and their bias. They're not really interested in the truth at all. Although they come to him asking a question, they're not really interested in the truth at all. They didn't believe John because he wasn't one of them. And they're not going to believe Jesus either, because he's not one of them. And whatever he says to them, however much evidence he gives them, he was, he's not going to make a scrap of difference. And he knows it. They're not interested in the truth. For these people, power is too important. Popularity 
is too important. They're not interested in the truth. And I guess this is particularly tragic because these people are supposed to be the teachers of the truth and it's particularly relevant because the danger is that we can be just like them. Uh, we think of ourselves, we tend to think of ourselves you know, in the modern West as, as rational people, science-based people, we'll go wherever the truth leads us. That's often that's really not true at all. Often we are more interested in convenience than the truth, in popularity than the truth, in freedom than the truth. Aldous Huxley was a, um, a novelist, a philosopher, an intellectual of the last century. He was deeply opposed to organized religion, um, and he sought in his writings to argue that, no, that life has no meaning at all. He says, we're free from God. We're free to build our own moral system. That's what he said. But later on in his life, it was interesting. Um, he acknowledged the only reason he said this, that there is no meaning at all, was not because he actually thought it was true, but because he wanted it to be true. I um, mean, he said this, it's on the screen. He said, I have motives for not wanting the world to have meaning. Consequently, it seemed it had none, and was able without difficulty to find satisfying reasons for this assumption. For myself, the philosophy of meaningless was, meaninglessness was essentially an instrument of liberation. We objected to morality because it interfered with our sexual freedom. Most ignorance is vincible. Ignorance, that is, you can overcome it. We don't know because we don't want to know. That is a very honest statement. So often people believe what they want to believe. And that was the case with the religious leaders. They're not interested in the truth. And I guess the question for us is, well, what about us? <laughs> Are we willing to be those who believe the truth about Jesus, the truth about God, even if it makes us unpopular in our time? Even if people say about us, you're on the wrong side of history, will we stand up for what we know is true? And even if it means that we have to make changes in our lives, even if it means we're not able to make the changes that we might want to make, even if righteousness is uncomfortable, which it so often is, are we going to hold to the truth? The sobering thing in this passage, I think, is that because the religious leaders come to Jesus with this attitude, they leave learning absolutely nothing. Their self-blindness stops them from seeing. And that can be true for us too. If we don't come to God hungry, we will leave empty. If we don't bring a big bucket to the tap, if we come only with our hands, well, the water will slip out right away. We'll take away nothing. These people are not interested in the truth. That's the first mark of the religious leaders. Here's the second, and it becomes increasingly blatant. They don't want to do what God wants. So Jesus tells them this parable. It's about two sons, uh, their father and a vineyard. Um, the father asks the first son to come and work in the vineyard. And he says, no, he's not going to do it. But then he changes his mind. Literally, he repents and he goes and does it. Well, then the father asks the second one and he says, yes. But he does nothing. He doesn't go at all. And then Jesus asked, verse 31, well, which of the two did what his father wanted? And the religious leaders say, rightly, well, the first son. And then Jesus is very direct. Verse 31, truly, I tell you, that is the religious leaders, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even when you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. So Jesus says to the religious leaders, you, you are like the second son. You say, yes, 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 yes. We're on God's side. We're his people. We represent him. But you don't do what he wants you to do. You claim to worship God. You, you put on the clothes. You go to the right places. You speak for him. You speak about him. You say, yes, 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 but you don't do what he wants. You don't repent. That, that is, you don't turn from your sin. You don't believe, you don't lean on God, you don't trust. Whereas the tax collectors and the prostitutes, they're more obviously no people. They're, they're more obviously sinners. That Their lives are more obviously lived in blatant rebellion. But he says, look, when John the Baptist came calling people to repent, 
because Jesus was coming, the Lord, well, they did. They understood the gospel. That their sins do not mean they cannot come back to God. They're not too far from God. They understand that God will have anyone back who turns to him. It's a wonderful reality. It doesn't matter how we've lived. It doesn't matter how terrible our sins may have been. It doesn't matter how guilty we, we may feel about them, how ashamed, how dark our past is, even our present. If we turn to Jesus, he will have us back. Our sins are not too hard for God to forgive. Jesus bled for them. He really did. Our sins are great, but they're not greater than God's mercy. As, as we sing in that wonderful line, our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. That's what they understood. I wonder if you understand that this evening. And so that the tax collectors and the prostitutes, because they repented and believed, well, they enter the kingdom of God. But the religious leaders are not willing to do this. And so they miss out on the kingdom of God. That's the message. Religious frauds who do not repent and believe will not enter the kingdom of God. And see, in many ways, I think this teaches us that the Christian life is perhaps simpler than we often think it is. It, it really is about these two things, repentance and faith. That's the call of Jesus, repent and believe. Uh, are you willing to repent, uh, to turn from your sin? Yes, for the very first time when you become a Christian, but also every day to keep on turning from your sin. Are you willing to believe, to not trust in your own righteousness, but to trust in Jesus and what he's done for us on the cross? These two things, repentance and faith, these are the mark of the Christian. And yes, there may be many other things that, that you and I are naturally associate with following Jesus, but that really is the heart of it. It's the core, it's the engine. Take, for example, a car. Now, I don't know much, too much about cars. I guess that may be quite obvious as I speak about them. But I do know that for a car to move, it needs an engine. An engine is a kind of non-negotiable when it comes to a car. If a car has no engine, it's not really a working car. But of course, when you go to buy a car, there are loads of gimmicks associated with cars that come with the car that, that people might try and persuade you are really necessary and important and relevant and might kind of seal the deal for you when you think about the car. Maybe it's some air conditioning, electric sliding doors, a heated windscreen, inbuilt GPS, padded seats, a TV on the back of the chair, anything to kind of create the lounge experience whilst you're in the car. There's a personalized number plate, inbuilt perfume dispenser, maybe that's it for you. A gesture control feature, heated steering wheel, crystallized headlights to refract the lights. Loads, loads of things, loads of gimmicks. But it is easy to get confused because none of those things are essential to the car. They're extras. And you can have all of those gimmicks without, but without the engine, it's not really a car. It's useless. It's a fake. And in a similar way, this is true of the Christian. The mark of the Christian is repentance and faith. That is what God is seeking. And someone might have all the gimmicks. Uh, they might know the Bible inside out, back to front. They might, they might teach the Bible really well. They might follow all the right people, read all the right blogs, and be able to say all the, all the lingo. But if they don't repent and believe, they're not the real thing. Now, the day you stop repenting, the day you stop believing, you take a path, which although might look like quite a similar path to the, to the, to the path which takes you to the kingdom of God, actually, you join the path which will take you away from the kingdom of God. Repentance and faith, that is the heart of it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German believer who was killed um, by the Nazis in World War II. And he wrote in his time about the danger of uh, what he called cheap grace in the church. Now, the idea that because we're saved by God's grace, because we're forgiven for our sins, we don't really need to repent of them. And he said this, cheap grace is the deadly enemy of the church. It is the grace we bestow on ourselves. It is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession. It is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ. 
Whereas real grace, biblical grace, costly grace, he says, is costly because it causes us to follow. And it's grace because it causes us to follow Jesus Christ. And see, this is, I think, the warning that we're seeing here in Jesus' parable. We must not think we are on God's side if we don't do what he wants us to do. And we mustn't bestow grace on ourselves, claim that God is for us and we're for him if we're not willing to repent. We mustn't say the Bible says one thing and I'm going to do another. This is the mark of the religious leaders here. They don't do what God wants. And the question for us is, are we going to do what God calls us to do? And are we going to keep on doing it? Are we going to be marked by repentance and faith? That's the problem for the religious leaders. They don't do what God wants. Okay, let's let's um, think then about the, the third mark of, of the religious leaders. Why is their religion a sham? Well, here, here Jesus really twists the knife and he says, because they are completely opposed to God. He tells another parable which um, expands on this vineyard theme. Um, it's about a landowner who plants a vineyard. Verse 33, he put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it and built a watchtower. Then he rents the vineyard out to some tenant farmers. And for the original hearers, as they're listening, this is actually quite a familiar story. Um, in Isaiah chapter five, we have something quite similar. Uh, Israel is described as a vineyard. God is the owner, he builds a watchtower and a wine press, and he's looking for fruit. And so I think that uh, as they hear this, the religious leaders would have been pretty quick to understand the meaning of the story. Ah, oh, yes, the landowner, that's God. The vineyard, that's Israel. The farmers, well, that's Israel's leaders. And at harvest time, when the landowner wants fruit, well, that's about God looking for obedience. And then he sends his servants. That's the prophets of the Old Testament. But as you read the story, what, what, what do the farmers do to the servants? Verse 35, that's the shocking thing. That we read that the tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. And if you read the Old Testament, well, that's, that's what Israel did to the prophets. As Jesus will say in the next chapter, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. And yet as the story goes on, it only gets more sinister. It's a bit like reading a children's fairy tale. You realize actually these are quite dark. The landowner has generously loaned his abundant vineyard to the farmers. And then he's just wanting to claim what is rightfully his but they only seem to hate him for it. They resent him, they oppose him. And though you, you see in this story that he is patient with them, they are only increasingly callous. Verse 36, then he sent other servants to them more than the first time the tenants treated them in the same way. So what does the landowner do? Well, verse 37, to me just seems utterly reckless. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. Reckless? Maybe patient, absolutely. He gives them yet another chance. But verse 38, when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir, come, let's kill him. Take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. It's a kind of pulsating madness in their behavior. Now, there's no thought, there's no wisdom, there's no care. This plan is not going to work out well for them but they can't see it they are blindly bent on evil there's a kind of malevolent nastiness that overshadows their ability to think carefully or consider the consequences and so they kill the son and it's at this moment of drama that Jesus pauses and he comes out of the story did you see he he, he says to the religious leaders therefore when the owner of the vineyard comes what will he do to the tenants and of course it's a no-brainer it's not hard to answer and they get it absolutely right. Verse 41, they say, well, he'll bring those wretches to a wretched end. He'll rent the vineyard to other tenants. He'll give them his share of the crop at harvest time. Yes, of course he will. What else could he possibly do? He's only given them what they deserved. He's left with no choice. He must bring justice to those farmers, those wretches he must bring to a wretched end. They don't deserve anything else. He must give the vineyard to others. But <laughs> do you see the irony? of this the irony is that the religious leaders have just condemned themselves because jesus says verse 42 have you never read the scriptures the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone the lord has done this and it's marvelous in our eyes 
Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. Do you see what Jesus is saying? He's saying to the religious leaders, you, you are the tenants in the story. And I, you ask me, what authority do I have? Well, here we go. I, I am the son, the son who has come from the father. And he knows they're going to kill him. And he knows it's the stupidest thing they ever would have done. And it's as if in the story he is gently pleading with them not to do it, to see where opposition to God is going to take them, to see where opposition to him is going to take them, to see that he is like that rejected stone, the stone the, the, the builders chucked away, and yet be, the stone that becomes the, the, the key stone, the cornerstone. And if they kill him, they're going to have to answer to God for it. And if they kill him, they're going to have to stand before him one day when he's vindicated in his glory and give an answer to how they have, for how they have treated him. And yet the tragedy is that when the religious leaders hear the story, they understand it is against them, but they don't hear the warning. The saddest part is what comes at the very end, verse 46. In response to the parable, they looked for a way to arrest him. But they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. And so rather than heeding the warning, they continue to play their part. And I take it the reason that they do that is because they are completely opposed to God. Now, they've reached the point of no return. They've gone too far. Now, they've so hardened their hearts to God that they cannot hear this gracious, gentle call to stop and to come back. It's like the whisper has been snuffed out by the loud shouts of the crowd. They've gouged their eyes out, they've cut off their ears, they can't see, they can't hear, they won't turn because they are completely opposed to God. And if only they could hear the message of the parable, that God is recklessly patient, that he is unspeakably kind, that he's slow to anger, that he's abounding in love, and if we don't see it, if we don't marvel at that, well, other people will, and we'll get left behind. If we persist in opposing God, we leave him with no choice but to oppose us. Jesus will triumph, and we want to get on the right side of reality by following him. And yet these people, they're completely opposed to God. What does this teach us about this kind of opposition, this sin? Well, it teaches very briefly three things. It teaches us that sin is ungrateful. Most people assume today, I think, that not believing in God is, is not really a big deal. But the Bible says that God has given us everything that we enjoy in life. To ignore God, to shut out God, our generous creator, it's not a trivial mistake. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sin of deep ungratefulness. He's the God who's given us everything. It's also shameful. Um, the attitude that we see here towards God of deep hostility is an attitude that really we see all the time today. And claiming that God has no right over our world, over his world and over our lives. We talk about our planet. Uh, we talk about my body and my life. Well, of course, it's all, it all belongs to God. God has given us everything that we enjoy, every breath that we breathe, minds to think, hearts to love, lives to enjoy. And it is shameful to do what most of us do. We edit the author out of the story. It's an act of cosmic plagiarism, taking what is God's as if it were our own. It's a shameful thing to do. And sin is also short-sighted. That's kind, you can't escape from seeing that. God simply cannot allow evil to go on forever. And Jesus will reign. One day we're told the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And if we shut God out of the picture... Well, he, we, we are, he is left with no choice. Judgment will come. We do condemn ourselves if we take on the attitude of these religious leaders. They're completely opposed to God. And so we're left here with a pretty grim diagnosis of religious fraud. Only the church can produce a Judas. Those who claim to worship God, but in reality, those who are not interested in the truth. Those who don't want to do what God wants and those who are completely opposed 
to God. And as we hear this this evening, there's a stark warning to heed, to heed it, uh, to, heed, to, be not, to not be like them, and instead to pursue a very different path, to be those instead who, who are eager to hear the truth, coming to Jesus hungry to learn, uh, to be those who are eager to do what God wants, whatever the cost, daily turning from sin, hoping in Jesus, and to be those who are eager to run to Jesus, to find rest in the sun, gladly giving him our worship, our obedience, our everything, our best.